You're in a room called George. Yeah, that feels strange. So. I know, a little bit. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Pre-Accident Investigation Podcast. I'm your host, Todd Conklin. How are you? Good, I hope. It was really fun seeing. I saw a whole bunch of people at HPRCT. That was really fun, you guys. Thank you. Gave a little talk. Um, I think I lived through it. It was it was fun, for sure. Spent some time on the couch. Walked up a million stairs because it was the hotel full of stairs. That hotel, I don't know what to think of. I love the meeting area, but, man, it's weird to get around that place. But we can talk about that later. Hope all is well for you. Let's see. Today is an exciting podcast day for a ton of reasons. I'm trying to think what they are, but I'm sure there's a million, and I'll get them all in here if I can get them in for you. One is we get to spend time together, so that's enough right there. I mean, that that is plenty. We've we've done everything we can possibly do to hang out with each other, and that's always fun. Secondly, I interviewed um, my buddy Sidney Decker, and I got to spend some time with him um, a couple weeks ago with the Avangrid people, and we had a great time. It was really fun to see him. It was fun to see everybody. I had a, a really amazing time. But I got to talk to Sidney about his new book, The Foundations of Safety Science. Uh, and it's basically a 100-year look at really the history of safety so far. Um, what can I say about it other than it's it's daunting looking because it's very textbooky, but I think it's quite brilliant in the fact that you can kind of slice it and dice it and use it the way you want to. And the premise is, and you know this premise well, if we don't know the past, we're destined to repeat the past. And if you don't believe that, just look around the world right now. Goodness me. But it's a really great decade by decade discussion of kind of the greatest motions, the, the ideas at the time that were novel and new and really moved the industry forward. And he talks about it in a quite amazing detail. It's very good. It's it's clearly from his point of view, but that's fine. I mean, I kind of like that even. And it's a really, it's a really good discussion. It's a really good resource tool, and it's a great discussion. Maybe that's a better way to say that. On on things like Frederick Taylor and and Heinrich and behavioral uh, focus safety and observations and all the things that we all know about because we live in. And I think for anybody, whether you're a safety person or not a safety person, if you're on the reliability side or the DevOps side or medical, or it's it's a really great discussion. I can't say really enough today. It is a very, very good discussion, and I like how you can use it. So uh, clear, I'm a fan. It's clear. There's no question there. But I think our discussion went a little even beyond that, and we got to talk a lot about really – the direction things are taking and the way the world is moving and what that means to us. And, and that's a great discussion because out of that, I can definitely tell some things. And that is that the world is starting to adopt a lot of these ideas. And where once these were exciting, sexy, and new, now we're at a point where we're generating sustainability and really looking at application. And I'm not telling you a thing. I mean, you know that. And I'm seeing at least, and I'm probably projecting here, but at least in my side of the world, I'm seeing Sydney talking about slowing down. And I'm certainly feeling that same way as well. And about creating people and knowledge and skills and resources that are out there in the world so that everybody could pick up these ideas and run with it. Not exclusive to anybody. Everybody can. And so I think that's where this book really comes from. And it's it's a great book. He He took a... He took a little spin there to the existential, and he kind of came back around with this year's book around the history, and it's worth looking into. I think you'll I think you'll find it quite interesting, uh, and that alone is worthwhile. I'm trying to think if I have any good stories to tell you. Uh, hmm, I'm sure there's been. I've I just had an awful experiences on the airline, but so are you. So, I mean, you know, if you're flying a lot right now, you know how hard it is. The summer's hard anyway. Then take away a whole bunch of planes that they normally use for domestic flights, the the 737 MAX 8, MAX 9s. And so everything's packed, and everybody's kind of in a bad mood. 
and some work slowing down and some work speeding up. It's it's a crazy time right now. There's no question about that. But I guess that's what keeps us sane. I personally just drove to the last one, and that was really freeing. It was fun to drive. It's fun to be in charge. I like that a lot. And so here we go. I'm going to go back out to my uh, porch, my patio, the news porch, watch TV, sit in my lazy boy, and enjoy the beautiful New Mexico evening. It is a beautiful evening. I'm going to let you listen to Sydney and I have a deep discussion around the foundations of safety. Just a couple of old friends sit in a room named George talking. So see what you think, and I'll come back to you after it's over. This is the Pre-Accident Podcast, and here comes Sydney Decker and Todd Conklin. Oh, it's lovely to see you again. It's Thank you for having me back. You. And you've been good? Uh, very good. Thank you. Very um, busy. Uh, yet another book. And the good kind. So tell us about this new book. Yeah, I'm really the, curious. Yeah, it's the biggest one yet. Um, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't my intention to write a really thick book. But when you decide to write a textbook, it becomes thick very quickly. Yeah. Because there's much that you must include. Yeah, there's, there's. I mean, it started like textbooks usually start, which is, you know, you teach a course, you right. teach a class, and you go, mm, I'm pulling all this disparate material together, and I've written bits and pieces here, bits and pieces there, and I really need to have the ideas of other people included in this class because it's it's about, you know, critical perspectives on safety and history, safety, science. Um, and so the best way to solve that is to actually uh, uh, write the book yourself. But... It's interesting, uh, in, in sharp contradistinction to some of the previous books, um, it's a book mostly about ideas of other people. Right. And so that got really boring at some point. <laughs> but, uh, and maybe that's the wrong word, and yet I'm, I'm not sure a book like this existed before. No, this correct. Is, this it's, is really new territory. No, I bet in many ways bringing all that information together was pretty interesting. In one place, absolutely. And interesting in the sense of what's the right way to actually bring it together. Yeah, and yeah. so... What um, what I decided was to use sort of the episodic approach. Um, I mean, call it Foundations of Safety Science is the title of the book. Um, and uh, but the 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 way in which safety science has developed, there's so many interlinkages, and of course, I mean, even the stuff that we do, right, is informed and inspired by by more than a hundred years of people before us trying stuff, putting ideas out there, drawing little cartoons and pictures, and um, thinking through this um, and the way that I decided to do it, as I said, was episodic and just say, all right, let's start somewhere in the 19, early 1900s and then uh, pick a decade and describe what happened there and the main ideas that came out and what they're based on and then how they're still visible in stuff that we do today, which is why every chapter is called, you know, is, is called after or named after a particular main idea from that decade, right. but then pulls it into uh, the current era where we are now and how we're still using uh, that idea from that from that decade. Basically. And developmentally, when you look at those episodic, seems brilliant too. When you look at those developmentally, you you really are you're able to sort of tell the story. You understand how we got to where we got to. Ah, it's my story, you know. And, and other people will have a very different angle on how we mm-hmm. developed and where why we are where where we are now. Um, and I say that in in the preface, you know, this is this is my um, my story, my history. It is an artificial distortion into linearity of what is really a very complex story of co-development and co-inspiration. And, um, the story is, well, the story. There's no the story, obviously, but this, right. is, this is my story. A book forces you to tell a linear story because one page comes right. after the next page. And so you can't say, oh, let's flip around and go back. No, you can only do that. I mean, even a film doesn't really allow that way right um, so it has to be linear somehow so and chronology seems at least in the west to be a very sort of linear organizing device so what's more? what surprised you as you were writing it well i mean wh- what did what did you take out of this activity because there had to be definitely yeah, some moments for good, you where you're like oh that's a good question good question the uh the interesting the mo- one of the most interesting chapters was um was the one on safety culture that's uh gosh that shows at the end of it um the, um, the the many and, and multifaceted problems that that concept is dogged with, and the way in which the um, um, 
thinking about safety culture really was a political concern, right, in order to make Very it legitimate so. to critique Soviet Union and their nuclear power and how, how all of that came about. So I, I, I was forced to tell that story. Say, this is where the concept comes from, right? We now throw that thing around as if it is clearly defined. And, and then you find out that I think it was like 40% of the studies that talk about safety culture don't define it. Yeah. Right? So you got all this this academic material, safety culture, they don't define the central concept that they purport to be talking about. You go, that's not science. I mean, how can we make progress, right? Yeah. And so, and the other thing that I found really interesting about this was that every decade, you know, you come up with a new idea and, you know, you start with, oh, let's, let's do, um, let's do uh, tailor and procedures and proceduralized uh -huh. work and managers are smart and workers are dumb, right? And uh, that's an idea from the 1910s and, in fact, probably predated by that by by how the industrial revolution happened and work started industrializing and everything but um you still see that today in in the way we talk about workers and the fact that they should be compliant and you know because somebody else has thought up a way how you should do this this work and so these dumb workers need to just comply with the procedures and the designs created by smart people uh, and they'll be they'll be fine um but so what i was going to say was that one of the things that i found really interesting and delightful about the um uh, every school of thinking uh, about safety seems to come as an innovation that is a pushback onto what had just come before. Um, you see you know, behavioral safety, for example, is being responded to uh, quite forcefully by human factors, right? The behavioral safety says you can change behavior by changing behavior, right? And you can influence behavior by influencing behavior. Um, no, says human factors, that's nonsense. You can only influence behavior by changing the world in which people do their work. That's 1940s versus 1930s. And so they respond to each other. Um, however, every school of thinking in, in safety through, throughout the, 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 the past century, century and a half, after innovating, seems to somehow fall into a moral trap. Yeah. And what I mean by that is... Um, even up to the point of resilient engineering, which is sort of the latest stuff right. Right in, the, in the last chapter of the book, um, we are now back at a place. You know, we've we've been um, we've been through uh, through man-made disasters in 1970s. We've been to Swiss cheese, and you know, in, in the 1980s, and uh, which in itself is not new at all. I mean, the, the defenses in depth thinking is, of course, 50 years be before that even. Um, but um, and then you go through safety culture, or, or sorry, you go through high reliability theory and normal access theory, you go through safety culture, and you come to resilience engineering, and you discover that old schools of thinking somehow take the precepts and principles that they're based on and turn them into moral devices to then turn onto people and say, you should have been more resilient. You should have had a better safety culture. And we start accounting for what people lack relative to what our theory came up with, and which is a fascinating turn in some sense, um, and, and seems to fulfill a very basic human need. Do you think that's because, so I find that really interesting, because I agree with you, the moral judgment part is really, I mean, you just see it all over, and you've seen it historically. Do you, do you think it's because we still can't basically overcome the kind of the existential threat that failure there must be a reason why this failed, and if we were smart enough, wise enough, good enough, moral enough, try, try, try hard enough. Yeah, we yeah, will morning. determine yeah. where the center is. Right. I think you're apt. Yeah, I think you put the finger on the sore spot. I think that's exactly it. The existential concern, and I've written about that in other in other books, sure. in other places. You know, that the um, I mean, like the end of heaven, right? Where, yeah, where yeah, I yeah. talk about how the existential concern. Um, intrudes into the epistemological one. Yeah. The epistemological one is, you know, how do we know what happened? But the existential one is, why does suffering happen? Yeah, why, why, do make do things, yeah. why do bad things happen to, you know, well-intentioned people? Um, well, because they actually weren't well-intentioned. Yeah. Yeah, and we can prove it. Give me time. We can, right, give me time. We can show that, you know, they should have done more efforts, like, you know, invested more efforts to create a better safety culture. And, their safety. and, and so, and almost inevitably, um, Certainly in Western thinking, that gets reduced back to the individual. What I mean by that is we say, you know, they didn't have a good safety culture. Yeah, but how is safety culture defined? As the beliefs and behaviors and attitudes and values uh, of individual of workers. Individuals, yeah. And so ultimately safety culture reduces to the individual worker who sucks, who is not morally committed enough to have better values and better commitments and better behaviors. Um, 
very base in some sense. So in a way, it's it's charming and it's it's uh, it's um, comforting to see humanity not progress a whole lot <laughs> over the past century to have. On the yeah, other, yes, yeah. On the other hand, you go, oh man. Um, and I become morally outraged. I go, we we really should be doing better. I agree. This. But but it's weird. I'm having to learn in the current political situation of the world that I used to think progress was just unidirectional, but it's cl- clearly we we move backwards and forwards in thinking, and that was a hard lesson for me. Uh, the textbook idea seems brilliant to me, almost to the point of I wonder why we didn't start with some textbook. This message is not being coded well in universities. No, it globally. isn't. Not and part of the reason maybe is we've never really had a vehicle by which to have these discussions, the foundations of safety, and, and perhaps the textbook, the timing is when it is, but perhaps this would have been a book to write first. Yeah. I don't know if you could have written it first. <laughs> I don't think I could have. I don't think I would have had the patience. If anything, I wanted my own ideas out there first. You know, yeah. It's a Safety Differently book and the Safety Anarchist and the field guide and just culture. Oh, man, these ideas, they need to go out of my head and into the world. Whereas the textbook really requires the patience to dig into the stuff that right. a lot of other people have done and try to compile it and put it together. But back to the, the myth of linear progress, um, I think in a way that my the, the textbook contributes to the, to the suggestion of that myth, right? That right. there is – that. Only, the only thing that happens in the development of safety science is that we get better and smarter, and we will get it right at some point. Right? That history is this linear story, and the 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 whose conclusion will be salvation. We will we will find the truth, and we will be able. We will find the recipe for how to stop suffering at the end of all of this. Right. Right? And indeed, that is a very Western story. Other cultures uh, don't look at um, at history in that linear fashion, uh, or are not prone to do as much do that as much as we would in the West. Um, you're right. They see it as much more cyclical and yeah. just repeating themselves in different forms and shapes and, and incarnations. Um, and, and it's very healthy to be reminded of that perspective. Do you find this new book makes your your previous books better or more solid or gives them a foundation? I mean, That's an interesting question. I actually have not thought about the relationship between the Foundations book and the other books that I've written um, almost without exception, I think the other books are uniquely dealing with an idea that that uh, I wanted to promulgate, um, and um, and they fall in you know the, the, the justice and learning and just culture, the uh, uh, understanding human error uh, in the in the field guide, the uh, existential versus epistemological in in the end of heaven, um, the uh, in, in in a sense. Um, pulling on the warning bell about bureaucratization and the stifling uh, of, 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 of rules and procedures in the safety anarchist, calling on a more humanistic and, and, and um, what's the right word, philanthropic, believing in, in your fellow human as a source of good and innovation, um, right, in the safety anarchist, um, that I don't, I, okay, I, here's the answer. <laughs> because this wasn't an answer at all, but uh, this came to an answer. The answer is I owe an immense intellectual debt to all of the stuff that's in the textbook. Of course I do. Had I read it all before I started writing my own stuff? No. No. In fact, I was forced to read some of the stuff and pull it together in the process of writing the textbook. Um, and, you know, sometimes that uh, that perhaps I, I can't really recall, but I'm sure it must have led to some embarrassing discoveries going, oh, man, I should have quoted this particular yeah. source or this used this reference when I was putting out that idea. Um, and uh, it, it's very humbling in the sense that, you know, there, I'm not going to say there's nothing new under the sun, um, but, but uh, there is, uh, there, there, there's, there's a lot of people, smart people, who thought about these problems and, and came up with what were for their time and their context, very innovative solutions, including Heinrich, including Heinrich. You know, I mean, uh, you can say, and I do <laughs> say a lot of things and and, and, and critique um, in, in that work, um, but you find out that in the 19, late 1920s when he was gathering his data, uh, well, I mean, he wasn't gathering data in a scientific sense, he was an insurance man, but um, when, he was, when he was working and then published in the early 30s, he was really a pioneer in saying, look, there are systematic ways in which we can control hazards so that we don't expose people to these 
situations in which they get hurt or killed in the first place. And in that sense, it's almost a human factors commitment, right? Saying, let's change the situation in which we put people, change the tools and the tasks so that they don't get exposed. Now, unfortunately, right, he then, he then gets interpreted and also himself gets more morally committed toward the behavioral side and telling, you know, the worker is the problem. We need to fix the worker um, over and over. So, uh, but those were interesting and humbling discoveries. Do you find yourself morally committed to safety differently ideas? No, 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 no. If you, if I, if I were to morally commit to any of any of my ideas, that would be hubristic and stupid. Uh, absolutely, no, no, no. I'm not only willing to be proven wrong um, on, on anything I've ever said. Which Desirous of it, you want it to happen. Huh? Oh, I don't know whether <laughs> I want that to happen, but um, no. But I, I, ideas are always preliminary and and imperfect and partial and and and, and badly informed, and so. You know, um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't put them out there to create conversations and discussions and perhaps uh, sufficient controversy to create the energy for conversation to get started. Um, if I were shy about putting out ideas, I wouldn't write a book a year. You know, yeah. So I, I would do. But uh, so, no, I, I, I don't think it is, uh, it's, it's changed in any way. It's remarkable. So, what do you recommend? How do you re recommend using this book for a practitioner? I mean, how, how would you recommend the average safety person, somebody who's read most of your books? What do you want them to think and do while they're in the process yeah, of reading Yeah, good question. This? Good question. I think that this is one of the few books that actually can be read from cover to cover because it is chronological and yeah. it takes you on this journey. I hate the word, but this, this, uh, this stepwise development of ideas and how they interlink. Um, yes, you can read, you know, if you want to learn about high reliability theory and normal accident theory, you can read one particular chapter, right? That is about that era that those ideas came out in. Um, you will miss some of the context before and after. Uh, if you want to learn about Heinrich, you know, read the chapter in the 1930s and you'll learn about that and, and, you know, how it shows up in what we do in behavioral safety today. If you want to learn about Swiss cheese, well, first read Heinrich because that's really where those ideas started. Um, and then uh, you can learn about that. But so you can read from cover to cover. Um, my hope is obviously that um, that this book will be used a lot in, in university classes. Oh, you just made it super attractive in that description you just gave. It makes it super attractive because that allows you to sort of look at some of the origins, yeah. uh, some of these ideas early, kind of in depth. And I love how it's episodic. It seems brilliant. It's been one of my um, what's the right word? Not frustrations, vexations. Uh, no. Um, let's, let's put a positive spin on it. It's one of been, been, been one of my invitations to recognize that there is a thirst and need for greater literacy mm -hmm. in safety professionals about what it is that they're doing. Very yeah. often they come from backgrounds that have very little to do with safety. Right. Some may have an occupational hygiene background that would work. Some, in fact, have a safety background. But then mostly the you know, education that they might have had is organized around best practices and rules and regulations that are applicable, regulatory bodies that have things to say about their jobs. And they don't really understand or know about the great variety and of and interlinkages between the many theories of, of safety uh, that exist out there. Oh, there was an interesting discovery that I, I wouldn't want to mention, actually, um, which is consistent throughout the 100-plus years of theories that are in that book, um, that none of the theories believes or has the apparatus for explaining that zero is possible. None of them do. They're oh, all really? They're all pessimistic in their own way. Yeah. Absolutely. None of them believe that zero is possible. So when you make So there really is no origin story of zero like that. Not in science. No, no, no. no, no of no, course. No. It makes sense, but I mean there's none. No, correct. Nobody so even played with that idea. How it's a, it's literally an unscientific claim to make. If you say we have zero harm, that's, uh, that's literally unscientific. There is no theory, no safety scientific theory that says that that is possible. That's amazing. What do you see as the future of safety science? Where are we heading? I have not wanted to speculate about that. Um, I think the, um, however, the recognition that we are living in an increasingly complex, interlinked world, that Resilience engineering is trying to wrap its head around right. more than any other theory, right? right? Um, will hopefully shake 
both operational and safety leaders and practitioners out of the belief that we can keep going back to 1980s ideas about putting layers of defense between the thing we need to protect and the source of harm, right? Because uh, you know, we're talking late 1980s when Swiss cheese came out. That's 40 years ago. 40 years wow. ago. We live in a different world. Right? Yeah, completely. It's absolutely. And so if there is a future for safety science, it needs to lie in the recognition of that complexity, the interconnectedness, the... Um, and the new sorts of vulnerabilities and sources of resilience um, that, that, that that brings. Um, and with that greater recognition, I think we have to do a, a, a better job in terms of turning that theoretical apparatus of resilience engineering, which is almost impenetrable. You know, it's it's, it's uh, written in a very jargony way. It's, uh, it's, it's not easily accessible for, for, for safety people. Um, and turn it into something that we can harness and... and Put to use. What's your next book going to be? I'm not telling you. Really? It's a secret? <laughs> because the, uh, the title is, um, is uh, under negotiation. Okay. So, so it's under but, negotiation. Uh, yeah, but the content isn't not really. But the, um, but w the next book will be, uh, will have to be about the, um, I think, the, the collapse of universal belief in neoliberalism as the uh, as the as the answer to all of our ills. Um, this goes this goes back to uh, um, all right. Let's let's do that question. Again. Okay, what's your next book going to be about? So the next book I don't have the title yet because um, we uh, we're still debating that and the and the publisher as well. So. Uh, and it, it hasn't has certainly not been finished yet. But the um, um, what I want to do is introduce the Anglo world to uh, to something that because I speak the languages of, of of northern and western Europe, like French and German and Dutch, I have access to a literature that has been thinking about leadership and about safety in a very different way, rather than the Anglo model of of uh, of, of neoliberal governance. And, um, and so I'll unpack all of that in the book. And, and explain, look, there's a different way of doing this you know, Rhineland thinking. What does that mean? What does that mean in terms of horizontally coordinating work? What does that mean in terms of already accepting that workers are smart and that they're your problem solvers? So it's taking some of the themes that animated safety differently and the safety anarchists and actually putting them into a, uh, a much richer context that can inform us how we can be leaders that enable people rather than disable people and constrain people and see them as a problem to control. Oh, that sounds amazing. Did you, the new book, did you do an audio, audible audio? What, what do you call it? Did you read it out loud in a little room? So the foundation said yeah. the book. Um, so the publisher has not uh, released the audio rights um, because I think um, they're discovering that there are better ways for them to make money with that. Um, of course. And the other thing is I don't know to which extent a textbook is audio bookable. I agree. Plus, it's hideously boring reading your own stuff. <laughs> well, Don't you find it boring? Oh, it's exceedingly boring. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not just boring. It's also riling because you go, oh, man, I could have said that better. Oh, that sentence. Mm, no, that, who edited this book? Yeah, and so, yeah, you get those. Things. But you shouldn't be editorializing your work as you're reading it because that screws up the recording. You're not pretty supposed badly. to do that? <laughs> well, you're not supposed to. No, you well, you can. You don't, you don't try it. to make things sound better. I no, but I know people who who listen to me reading it, and then they and they read along, and they, you know, if there's mismatches. <laughs> that's sort of, Ooh, that's horrifying. Um, well, I don't know. They don't tell me, but I mean, that's, yeah. Where can we see you if we want to come and see you? Are you out? Are you doing any exciting meetings in Australia? Yeah, or elsewhere. Uh, I'll be. Well, it depends on when you when you air this podcast, but <laughs> when, from when you go live, I don't. I don't July. Know. Where can I see you if I want to come and see you? Or where can we see you if we want to come and see you? As in uh, see me talk yeah. or, or come come look me up at the uni in the lab? Or, well, that's uh, always a possibility. <laughs> that's certainly a possibility. Always welcome. It's a lovely part of the world. And uh, But um, the um, the next talks, oh, man, I, I'm not even sure. But there's stuff coming up in Paris. There's stuff coming up in Berlin um, and Amsterdam. Um, so there's a bunch of European stuff, actually. And that's Sidney and Todd sitting around talking about junk and stuff and books. His book mostly, The Foundations of Safety, A Hundred-Year Understanding of Safety Science. 
from the beginning to now. I'm curious what the next one's going to look like, you know, where we start predicting the future. Now, that would be a great book. It was fun. I always have a great time. It's, um, it, it, we, were, we were in New Haven, Connecticut, which is a smart. You just can't not be smart in that town. I mean, it just brings the smarts out in you. Sitting in a room called George. So there, that, that's, how you, that's how you enjoy that time. And uh, having a great conversation. I mean, it was really fun. It's a great chance to really dig in and understand the journey we've been on. I think you'll like the book a lot. I, I absolutely enjoyed the time I spent with Sydney, and I've really enjoyed digging through that book. I'm reading it kind of piecemeal, um, which is probably a, an offshoot of reading textbooks piecemeal anyway. I mean, kind of, I don't think I've ever read a textbook. Well, in fact, let me think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I've ever read a textbook in my entire life from cover to cover. I don't think you read textbooks that way. Maybe other people do. I might be a little, I mean, I could be an outlier. It could happen. But until then, my friends, that's the podcast. Thanks for spending time with us. It's just getting more and more fun. There's no question about that. Thanks for being a part of it. Tell your friends, subscribe, listen, give them away, play them at meetings. I don't care. It's, it's just for you. We're just building community, that's all. Building community and reinforcing one another. That's the entire point. Until then, learn something new every single day. I bet you did today. Have as much fun as you possibly can squeeze into a day. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>